Excellent. Very exciting. Let's move on to RRTB um, and what's new in riff resistant TB. So this is where people usually not, not you've all heard, I think, wild rumors about the amazing stuff that's happening. It's important a little bit that you understand the diagnostics. It's important that you understand the classification when we talk about drug resistant TB because that's changed. And it's also important to have a little bit of an awareness of what the what the medicines are and some of the major adverse events because these patients might end up in your in your consulting room. So first it was quite exciting, and this there came a memo out in July of 2023, but it's not yet all and all the NHLS labs, but they're slowly going to get rid of the first line and second line LPA as we know it, um, and they've brought out something called the Expert MTB XDR assay. So it gets done in exactly the same gene expert machine as we do the um, the normal um, ultra experts, um, and that will lead to discontinuation of this LPA because this will actually test specifically for fluoroquinolone resistance. So fluoroquinolone resistance is how we decide whether somebody um, is MDR or not MDR. We'll look at the, the classification in a moment. Um, and so at the moment, what you're going to do, if you've got somebody where your normal gene expert comes back RIF resistant, you're still going to send a DRTB reflex test, like we've always done. Um, and what they've done in the past is they would have done the TB culture and then those LPAs, but now they will automatically do the TB culture. They will then do a genotypic testing for the fluoroquinolones, usually using this new XDR assay, um, but they will still send as well for phenotypic testing for, for bedaquiline. Um, and then using this MTB XDR, um, this result you're also therefore going to get within a couple of days. So we're going to be able to make a decision about regimens very, very quickly. And you don't, and then what the lab will do is they'll automatically do specific phenotypic tests depending on whether it's ferroquinolone sensitive or resistant. So let's just look at what the um, classification of drug resistant TB looks like. So mono resistant TB, that's easy you're resistant to one TB drug. What's important is to differentiate what we call monoresistant TB from what we call RIF resistant TB. RIF resistant TB is not the same as RIF monoresistant TB. And they created the term RIF resistant TB because we've got all these gene experts that come back RIF resistant. So if you've got gene expert positive RIF resistant, um, then you are resistant to rifampicin, but we don't yet know what else you might be resistant to. So we talk, everybody that's got RIF resistance fall under their own, own classification of RIF resistant TB. And there's lots of different types of RIF resistant TB. And that's why the guidelines are called RIF resistant TB guidelines. Polyresistant TB is more than one TB drug, but not rifampicin and INH together. The MDR TB definition has stayed the same. So if you've lost both INH and rifampicin, our classic first line drugs, we would call that multi-drug resistant TB. But they've changed the definition of pre-XDR-TB. Um, and now pre-XDR-DP is already, you've got MD, you've got resistance to rifampicin, doesn't matter what's happened with the INH, but you're also resistant to a fluoroquinolone, either levofloxacin mm -hmm. or moxifloxacin. So that we're now calling pre-XDR-TB. So XDR-TB now has got a new definition. In the old days, it was all about fluoroquinolones, but XDR-TB or extensive drug-resistant TB now you also have to have resistance to either bedaquiline or linezolid, which is our new miracle drugs in terms of second line treatment for TB. So in terms of the medication we have available, um, for those of you that's not so familiar with the, the drug resistant TB drugs, our three core drugs now for treating drug resistance TB is either our fluoroquinolone, so either levoflox or moxiflox, bedaquiline, which has revolutionized the treatment of drug resistant TB, and linezolid. So the one that's most problematic of this three is the linezolid. Very powerful drug, very important drug in our regimen, the one that causes all the trouble. Not nearly as much trouble as the injectables did in the old days, but this is the one that we normally have to watch. The two other drugs we like, um, they sort of are, are group B drugs, oclofazamine and terizodone, good drugs that can strengthen those top three. Um, and then we have the other drugs. Delaminid, I still see it in the WBHOC classification. Um, but these are newer drugs um, that are still uh, will probably work their way up the up the schedule eventually. So, in terms of how do we treat drug resistant TB? 
So firstly, you just try also try and figure out, does this person need a long individualized regime? So all your complicated patients, um, all your very sick patients or your extra pulmonary TBs, they're going to still get these very long regimens like we did in the old days. But pretty much everybody else, as long as the HP is over eight, is going to get this new regimen called B pal L. B my B and my pal L. B pal L. You can find ways to remember it. So it's the B, it's the PA, it's the L, and the L is four drugs in the B pal L. And I'll show you those in a minute. And what's amazing about the B pal L is that it's a six-month course. So when you start, when your patient's got RIF resistant, you're going to start them on B pal L. And now when that amazing gene expert and your results come back, if there's resistance, if they've got that extensive drug resistance TB that I spoke about, they're resistant to pedacquin and denazolid or protominide, that's that PA, they're going to get the long regimens. But notice here, if they've got INH resistance on that, uh, so they've got RIF mono resistance, we can definitely use the BPAL L. If they're fluoroquinolone sensitive, we can definitely still also use the BPAL L. But look, if they're fluoroquinolone resistant, so that's our pre XDR TBs, we're just going to stop the liver floxacin and they can still get the BPAL for only six months. So this has made things very much, uh, much easier. The fly in the ointment is that protominide is contraindicated in pregnancy. And so for pregnant women at the moment, they still have a different regimen with pedaquiline, delaminate, linezolate, and levofloxacin, and they get followed up differently. So it's six months. It's for all adults over 15 years. We'll talk about children in a minute and non-pregnant people. The B stands for bedaquilate. The, oh, I think I spelled that wrong. That's protonamide. Proton to, uh, that's PA. There's liniz linezolid, um, that you have to try and get in for at least a minimum of those two months if possible, um, and your liver flux. So that's the BPAL L that our patients are now taking. And I mean, that's extraordinary because it's still exactly the same month length of treatment now and exactly the same number of drugs than our patients that are on TB treatment. You can extend to nine months if there's extensive pulmonary disease or bilateral cavitary disease. Um, and as I say, we're gonna try and push that linezolid to six months, but it depends a bit on what the, the HB is doing. In children, um, the guy, the problem with all the studies of BPAL owl is was only done on adults. So again, we just don't know for children under 15 because the studies haven't been done on children under 15. But so far in terms of our experience, especially with the short nine months regimens, we know that most children don't require the whole 18 months. And so there are shorter regimens recommended, but these are based on expert opinion where they have designed regimens and I'll show you what they look like at the moment. Um, and these are still quite flexible. You can adapt them depending on the children's scenario. Um, and so you're gonna give this whole full months um, and you're definitely gonna include bedaquiline and delaminate in that and try and see if you can get some linezolid in for at least two months. So again, with children, you're gonna decide if it's severe disease or if it's non-severe disease, very similar to like we've done with uh, the TB, um, the DSTB children. And then these are the regimens. You don't obviously have to know these regimens. It's just to show you how the regimens work. For children with non-severe disease, they also recommend um, uh, two months and then, you know, the linezolid at least for two months, the whole regimen will be for six months. But you can see that they've got five drugs in that regimen and it's got our three group A drugs, that bedaquiline, linezolid, levofloxacin that I mentioned, and we're throwing in both the clofazamine and the terizidone. So they get those five drugs for six months and that will hopefully usually do the trick. And for severe disease, we will just treat them for nine months. And then your very, um, your bone diseases, your pericardial ones, they might get more complicated regimens, your CNS, and we would treat for 12 months. You don't have to know these regimens, it's just to take note. It's more important in your setting is the child that you see is whose parent has been diagnosed with MDR or XDR and has been exposed. So remember our drug sensitive TB children, we all treat them as contacts, our HIV positive children, you also wanna treat them as a contact. Um, so you have to be able to decide how to cover the child will depend on obviously the drug resistance profile of the adult. So if the child's mom, for example, had INH mono resistance, then we're actually gonna cover those babies rifampicin and you can see that's a four month course. If the mom had RIF mono resistance, then you're gonna give the baby iron age, then you can't get it away. So, but then you wanna make sure that that iron age was sensitive. You want to have all that DST results back and that will be six months. 
if the mom had MDR TB, so she had lost both rifampicin and INH, you can cover either just with levoflox on its own, or if there is, um, depending on the mutations according to INH, you might also add in um, INH to that. And again, you probably will discuss with an expert in those scenarios for our XDR TB patients or our pre XDR TB patients. So those who are furoquinolone resistant, um, you're going to expect uh, there's not much options for them. So discuss with an expert. And what we'll do is, is we'll monitor them very closely for TB. Just on anezolet, all you need to know is. The three major side effects, peripheral neuropathy is a problem, and this is a peripheral neuropathy that does not respond to pyridoxin um, and can be very disabling if we do not keep an eye on that. The general rule is early on, try and see if you can how long you can get the linezolid on board. Later on, you would stop the linezolid. Anemias is our biggest problem with linezolid, and especially in people living with HIV, um, people are already quite ill, they already have quite low HPs. We are so desperate to get the linezolid on that we literally transfuse patients with packed cells to be able to keep them on the linezolid and be able to get them on linezolid. So when I was at Ngobela also, we'd get, when we diagnosed patients and the HBs were under eight, we would transfuse them and then put them on the, on the regimens. Optic neuritis, uncommon, but an issue. So actually in the drug-resistant TB program, we are supposed to be doing visual acuity testing at every visit. So if you've got a patient who comes in and they're on BPLL um, and they've got problems with vision, check the visual acuity and you want to get them off that linezolid um, immediately. So a couple of last um, odds and ends. Um, so the initiation of ART in patients on RRTB treatment has also changed. We used to treat this as a WHO4 condition, so we'd start everybody on two weeks. The guidelines now actually say if the CD4 is under 50, you start in two weeks, but just like with drug-sensitive TB, we would wait um, uh, that CD4 more than 50, apologies. Um, you will wait, you can wait two to eight weeks before you start, and that reduces your chances of iris. Meningitis, obviously, you'll wait to four to six weeks. The other thing that's um, interesting that's also come out is that the WHO has just brought out a circular in June, just the other month, yeah, just now for a new six month regimen that's come out. It's called the BDLLFXC, a little bit longer than the BPALL, mm -hmm. um, but you can see that's five drugs, but that's pedaquiline, delaminate, linezolid, levoflox, and clofazamine. So that's without the protonamide. And what makes this great is that you can therefore use it in pregnant women, children, and adolescents. Um, and we do have these drugs available. So this we'll see if that's actually gonna impact on our guidelines. Going, um, going forward. Uh, and now 